but good evening everybody. Uh, I know it's a late for you on a Friday evening and it's very early for me on Friday morning uh, in the US, but thank you for your uh, for your uh, attention. I unfortunately I was not able to attend your other sessions, but as we know today translation is a very important uh, part of our uh, of what's going on today. As we know that Gitanjali Shri's novel Tomb of Sand won the International Booker Prize last year, and this year I think we have the Tamil novel by Paramal. I'm getting his name wrong. Parumal. <laughs> has been nominated for the International Booker Prize this year. So it's a very timely topic and, and I think that this conference is, is uh, kind of dealing with the subject of translation. My, uh, my intervention today, my talk today has to do more with, um, I'm not a translator per se, but I, but I teach courses in translation. So my, the title of my talk is called Teaching French in Through Translation. So uh, a little bit of background um, about where I teach. I teach at a small four-year liberal arts college in, outside, in the suburbs of New York City. And our French enrollments, unfortunately, have uh, fallen in the last few years. So in order to attract more students to French, I have actually offered courses in translation, which was a way to introduce French history and culture uh, into to our students in order to attract more students to actually study French. So, and this was the way to teach French literature, history and culture in an interdisciplinary fashion and to at attract a larger non-French -spe non speaking student body with the hopes that they will then continue to take the French language. So I'm going to talk today about two courses. I don't know whether I'll get to the second course, but the, the two courses that I have taught several times is the first one is entitled City of Light, Paris in Literature and Film. And the second course I have taught is called French Cinema from the Nouvelle Vague to the Cinema de Bonlieu. And just to explain a little bit, and both courses, as I said, are interdisciplinary. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the first course, which is called City of Light, Paris in Literature and Film. Uh, what do I do in that may, course? With your permission, uh, may I request for a formal introduction on the platform? Excuse me, sorry. Ma'am, with your permission, maybe have can our students give a formal introduction? Oh, sorry. Did I start talking uh, mm. before your introduction? I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. My, so my mistake. My mistake. No, ma'am. Thank you so much. Your <laughs> presence is enough for everything. Okay. Thanks, students. Good evening and a very warm welcome to everyone present in today's meeting. We are thankful to our honorable director, Professor Dr. Kumkum Ray, our respected professors, our whole ASL department, and our special speaker of the day for lending their precious time. Today's workshop, like all the previous ones, will consist of intellectual discussion by our speakers, followed by a questionnaire. Let me take this opportunity to introduce Professor Dr. Kumkum Ray, our esteemed director of Amity School of Languages. Professor Dr. Kumkum Ray, senior Cambridge Honours graduate from Lady Sri Ram College, Delhi University, was awarded the best thesis award for her PhD degree on Henry Louis Le de Rosio the first Anglo-Indian nationalist poem. She is an educational social activist with 48 years of teaching experience. She is a member of the Area Advisory Board and Board of Studies of Amity University, Uttar Pradesh. Now I would request Pratyasha to speak further. International Translation Day is meant as an opportunity to pay tribute to the work of professionals which play an important role in bringing the dialogues, understanding and cooperation, contributing to development and strengthening world peace and security. Without translation, we would all be living in provinces bordering silence. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Benita Mehta. She is currently working as a professor in the Department of World Languages and Literature at Manhattan Village College, New York. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics 
and political science from St Xavier's College Mumbai she also has a masters of arts degree in french from university of georgia and phd in french from the graduate school cuny she is the member of the modern language association and american council on teaching of foreign languages and has published several articles and book chapters on french french literature and film her books widows parias and bayadars were published by bucknell university press in 2002 Her most recent research and writings has been on francophone comic books. Her book Postcolonial Comet Texts Events and Identities co-edited with Priya Mukherjee was published by Rotledge Mag Rotledge in May 2015. With this I would like to invite ma'am to begin with a session. Mute Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry I skipped the introductions. Um yeah, so as I was my talk today as I said is and as I said this conference is very timely given the um the recent attention given to translators especially in languages other than English. And I mentioned the two novels uh, one by Gitanjali Shri which won the International Booker Prize in 2022 and the the Tamil novel uh, Pyre that has been nominated this year is long listed uh, this year for the international booker prize anyway my approach to translation is uh, as follows as i explained earlier uh, i come from a four year liberal arts college manhattanville college which is about 40 miles from new york city and we offer french and italian and um, um italian and spanish but in recent years the enrollments in french have fallen so in order to attract more students to the language and to the history and culture i have offered courses in translation and this is one way to kind of also make the class more interdisciplinary and um and uh, and to attract this non french speaking student body the two courses that i have created and i hope to get to both today but maybe i'll focus on the first one is Uh, the first course is called City of Light: uh, Paris and Literature and Film, and the second is on French cinema from the Nouvelle Vague to the Cinéma de Bondieu. Um, a little bit about the uh, course on City of Light. So the Paris course that I teach is divided into segments that introduces students to the history, literature, and culture of Paris from the 19th century to the present day. Uh, it introduces the students to literature dealing with Paris. For example, we read. Uh, Balzac's uh, Old Goriot, Père Goriot, in translation that depicts Paris in the 19th century, uh, and uh, we also read and shows how class and money defined Parisian society in the 19th century. We also read Zola's L'Oeuvre or the masterpiece that traces the life of the artist Claude Lantier. and is the most autobiographical of Zola's novels and discusses his relationship to the painter Paul Cézanne. Lantier the main character is a thinly veiled portrait of Cézanne. It's set in Paris in the 1860s and 1870s and explores the milieu of the art world, especially that of the impressionists. Now the students in my class, those who are French majors and minors, have the option of reading the novels in French, though I offer they they can also read it in translation. And so both novels kind of provide this a uh, kind of a nice nuanced view of 19th century Paris. Uh, another segment of the class actually talks about the reconstruction of Paris under George Eugène Haussmann who who was uh, his uh, prefect of planning under Napoleon the 3rd um and we also read a couple of Baudelaire poems the in translation that show the changing Paris in the 19th century I was wondering if one of the students could share the video the first video dealing with Haussmann's Paris it's long it's a long video so I would I would try and cut it off at 7 uh, minutes 7.54 minutes thank you
where misery and pestilence and disease work in concert, where sunlight and air rarely penetrate. Paris is a terror. In 1845, a French social reformer wrote, Paris is an immense workshop of putrefaction, where misery and pestilence and disease work in concert, where sunlight and air rarely penetrate. Paris is a terrible place where plants wither and perish. Industrialization and rapid growth had simply left infrastructure behind. And in the 19th century, Emperor Napoleon III undertook one of the most ambitious plans of renovation ever undertaken in any city anywhere. And to oversee that renovation, he chose the skillful and audacious George Eugene Hausman. And between 1853 and 1870, Hausman transformed Paris from a squalid, disease-ridden city of the Middle Ages to the modern era with broad avenues, effective sewers, and beautiful parks. It is history that deserves to be remembered. By the 19th century, the overcrowding of Paris had become an acute social issue. As far back as 1739, the writer Voltaire had complained that the streets were showing off their filthiness and spreading infection. Say hello to Interlude, a girls' hostel where you can focus more on your goals and leave. The first Napoleon had ambitious plans as well, writing from his prison on St. Helena, that if he'd had 20 more years of rule and a little leisure, one would vainly search today for the old Paris. Nothing would remain of it but vestiges. The widest streets in the worst neighborhoods were only five meters, the narrowest only two. Carts and horses could hardly navigate these parts of the city. Elected the first president of France in 1848, Napoleon III worked as president to beautify the city, but was able to accomplish very little. It wasn't until he overthrew the government and declared himself emperor that the project would begin in earnest. After selecting Hausmann to oversee the project, the emperor asked him to give the city more air and space, to make it beautiful and to better connect the sprawling capital. The first stage of the project was to complete the Grand Crozet de Paris, a great cross that would bisect the center of the city and which had begun under the first Napoleon. The emperor wanted a new hotel built, the first luxury hotel in the city, the Grand Hotel de Louvre, in time for the Exhibition Universelle in Paris. The exhibition was a kind of world's fair held in 1855 was held partially as a response to the great exhibition held in London four years earlier. Hosman relished the challenge and worked 24 hours a day, had 3,000 workmen finish the most important parts of the cross and the hotel in time for the exhibition. The project involved tearing down enormous sections of the city, a task that Hausman called the gutting of old Paris. Many of the neighborhoods torn down were simply turned into the broad avenues that define the city today, and many small streets were eliminated entirely in favor of one navigable one. This was only possible because Napoleon III had made himself emperor. He had the parliament change the law so that Hausmann could seize land on either side of the streets, and he reported only to the emperor himself. Hausmann finished the cross in 1859, centered at a large square that was widened with two new theaters, which still stand today, facing each other across the Fontaine de Palmer, a victory fountain built under Napoleon I to memorialize his greatest military victories. The fountain itself was moved to sit at the exact center of the square and redecorated with sphinxes and more, designed by architect Gabriel Daviode. Daviode was almost as important to the project as Hausmann. While Hausmann worked on the greater design of the city, Daviode was the architect for many notable buildings built during this time, including the theaters in the central square, as well as other distinctively Parisian street furniture. He designed benches, balustrades, fountains, signposts, and much more during the renovation. This work, as well as that of other architects under Napoleon III, had a unique style, much of which can still be seen all over Paris today. One architect who designed during this time called the style simply Napoleon III. Possibly the most distinctively Hausmann part of the whole renovation were the buildings he built to line the streets of Paris. Hausmann planned the apartment complexes as architectural holes, treating them as he treated everything in the project as part of a larger urban design. While the interiors of the building were left up to the owners, the exteriors were strictly regulated. Uniformity of balconies and cornices was prioritized, even to the detriment of interior rooms. The facades were required to be either made or faced with stone, and the changes of the Industrial Revolution made it possible to cut and move the stone like never before. It is Hausmann's apartments, which line the streets of Paris still, that have left the most lasting mark on the character and appearance of the city. 
The first stage of the project was generally considered to be a success as Hausman opened up and beautified parts of the city. He had built about six miles of new avenues for a cost of 278 million francs, which, depending on how that is converted, would be between one and four billion U.S. dollars today. But the second stage was even more ambitious. He hoped to add another 16 miles of new avenues to connect the city center to the grand boulevards that had been created during the Great Restoration between 1814 and 1830. And he hoped to do that using 100 million fewer francs. The plan involved tearing down even more sections of the city and replacing them with new plazas, gardens, and buildings. The many theaters, hotels, and government buildings built during the renovation were meant to command the streets they sat on and be visible from long distances. One of the most dangerous neighborhoods of the city, the Petit Pologne, or Little Poland, was demolished during this time, and the square of the star around the Arc de Triomphe was redesigned with new avenues being added so that 12 avenues converged there. In 1960, the square was renamed after Charles de Gaulle. Additionally, this phase involved almost complete renovation of the Ile de la Cité, or one of the two natural islands in the Seine, along the center of the city. Until the renovation, the island had been largely residential, with the exception of the Eastern End, which since the 12th century had been home to the Cathedral of Notre Dame. The square in front of the cathedral was widened, bridges to the island completely rebuilt, and several large new government buildings constructed there. While some of these changes were welcome, the project began to garner persistent criticism. Critics complained that Hosman had destroyed much of the Luxembourg Gardens built in the 17th century, as well as the growing cost of the projects. The cost ballooned to some 410 million francs, partially because of local building owners claiming made-up shops had been torn down and petitioning the government for lost revenue. The enormous social cost was not imaginary, though, as thousands of Parisians were forced to transplant their lives with little recourse, and many critics believe the new apartments were pressing out poorer Parisians. Still, Hosman enjoyed greater status under Napoleon III and continued his projects. Streets were not the only thing that Hausmann was concerned with. Together with several colleagues that he brought with him from Bordeaux, four major parks were planned at the cardinal compass points around the city. Workers dug new lakes and constructed grottos, lawns, and gardens. In addition to the large parks, they built 24 new squares throughout the city. Hausmann's goal was to make parks and green spaces accessible to all Parisians. In total, he added over 2,000 hectares of green space to the city, and over the 17 years he worked, planted over 600,000 trees. He also revolutionized the city's woefully inadequate water and sewer system. He enlisted Eugene Belgrand to head the work, and Belgrand built new aqueducts to serve the city with more water and built the largest water reservoir in the world to store water for the city. He effectively quadrupled the number of homes in the city with running water. Belgrand's waste work transformed the city even more. Before the renovation, solid waste had to be picked up by sanitation workers, and the sewers emptied directly into the Seine. The new sewer was significantly larger, could handle the solid waste, was capable of draining water from basements where the Seine, when the Seine was high, could take in rainwater, and the large channels which drained the waste could be cleaned by specially designed boats. Gokul Dham is especially Bimar Gau Mata ki seva ki jati hai. Gau Mata ke saath saath kutte, billi, mo... The underground also provided gas to the city, gas that would turn Paris into the city of lights. In 1860, Napoleon III officially annexed Stop Paris. there. Oh, suburban Thank you. Communist quadrupling the city's population. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so the so we spend a segment of the class uh, talking about um, Hosman's, you know, redoing of Paris. And as you see, as you saw in the video, uh, the Paris of today very much is resembles the Paris that was Hosman's and Napoleon III's vision of what Paris should be. But it also displaced, as the video also showed, it also displaced a lot of people, uh, the population, because a lot of the old neighborhoods were destroyed. And there's a very, as I mentioned earlier, there's a very poignant poem by Charles Baudelaire, the 19th century poet, symbolic poet, called The Swan, or Le Signe, where you have the swan who is wandering the streets of Paris and kind of lamenting the end of the old Paris, you know, it's kind of so there's so I read that poem uh, after talking a little bit about Hosman. We also try read the poem along with that. So trying to kind of, as I said, bring in literature and culture into the particular course. Again, the, the poem is read in translation in English, but I often use a bilingual edition. Of
of Baudelaire's poem, so allows students to see the French and the English. So students who are studying French can actually read the poem in French. Um, another segment of the class deals with what is known as the Exposition Universelle that the gentleman in the video actually mentions, or also known as the World's Fairs. We all know that in 19th century, Paris had a number of World's Fairs in the 19th and the 20th century. And it was a way to show French progress in science and technology and Paris's emergence into modernity. Uh, for example, the 1889 uh, World's Fair, uh, they, they built the Eiffel Tower, Gustave Eiffel built the Eiffel Tower that was built for the fair, but there was never then destroyed. And many of the many of the monuments you see in Paris today, like the Petit Palais, were actually created in Paris uh, during these world's fairs and have now become part of French and they were never destroyed after the after these fairs. So I want to show one short video of the um, one short video of the first link about the World's Fair. So if you could, uh, if someone could kind of show the first video, it's about five minutes long. And then uh, there are two videos on there. And the second one on the Exposition Universelle of 1931, which was a little different. Now the first one does have subtitles. So if you, as you show the video, you can, uh, in the settings, it allows you to um, show the subtitles. Yes. Thank you. made some changes to his regime in response to popular outcry, giving Parliament more control and more voice to the opposition. Opponents latched onto Hausmann as a point of criticism, decrying oh, it's the... It's not this one, it's the other link I had sent you. ...and the project's Sorry. lack of oversight. An opposition... Ma'am, can you please tell us which one? It was the link, uh, the second link on the World's Fairs that... Um, World Fairs. Yeah, yeah, this is the one. This is the one, yes. This is the one. Yeah. Oh, this is the one. This is the second one. There was, must have been another link before that. Oh, yes, this is the one. Yes. This one. Yeah, and then the 1931 is the second one. Thank you. Okay. This one in the settings, you should be able to show some subtitles. So if you hit the settings of the video... Comment les expositions universelles mettent-elles en scène oh, le English, you could do the English uh, subtitles. À la fin du 19e siècle. La première exposition universelle est organisée à Londres en 1851. Le Royaume-Uni. Oh, maybe alors, not. Sorry, I thought there was an option. OK. Mais réalisation. Les concours valorisent le savoir-faire des pays invités. Oh, yes, you can pick English. Phénoménal. Napoléon III, invité d'honneur à Londres, organise deux expositions à Paris en 1855 et 1867. Elles sont suivies sous la Troisième République par quatre... You can put it on Hindi as well. I saw Hindi. There. Oh, okay. I'd earlier seen the English, so I'm not sure. Yeah, there was Hindi written on it. Yeah, I saw that. Roll it back. There's English, yeah, English or English Hindi. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Les expositions univers. Comment les expositions universelles mettent-elles en scène le savoir-faire technique et industriel de la France à la fin du 19e siècle La première exposition universelle est organisée à Londres en 1851. Le Royaume-Uni, alors en pleine révolution industrielle, y présente ses meilleures réalisations. Des concours valorisent le savoir-faire des pays invités. Le succès est phénoménal. 
Napoléon III, invité d'honneur à Londres, organise deux expositions à Paris en 1855 et 1867. Elles sont suivies sous la Troisième République par quatre autres en 1878, 1889, 1900 et 1937. L'exposition universelle de 1889, qui a pour thème le centenaire de la Révolution française, met en scène le progrès de la France républicaine et coloniale. Si les monarchies européennes boycottent officiellement l'événement, beaucoup de leurs ressortissants y participent. L'exposition accueille 30 millions de visiteurs et près de 60 000 exposants. L'esplanade des Invalides reçoit les expositions des colonies et du ministère de la guerre. Des reproductions de monuments et des villages représentent l'Afrique, le Pacifique et l'Indochine. Le public peut s'immerger dans des ambiances exotiques ou assister au spectacle de Buffalo Bill et d'Annie Oakley. L'art et l'industrie s'exposent au Trocadéro et au Champ de Mars, où la gigantesque galerie des machines témoigne de l'extrême solidité des nouvelles structures associant le métal et le verre. Les démonstrations du théâtrophone permettent d'écouter en stéréo des spectacles programmés dans les salles parisiennes. L'américain Thomas Edison offre la dernière version de son phonographe à Gustave Eiffel, car c'est la tour de 300 mètres, la plus haute du monde à l'époque, qui attire tous les regards. Lauréat d'un concours organisé par le gouvernement, le projet conçu par une équipe des entreprises Eiffel est au départ critiqué. Une pétition d'écrivains dénonce l'odieuse colonne de tôle boulonnée. Après deux ans d'ouvrage, l'originalité de la forme fascine. Elle est édifiée à partir de quatre poutres courbées et écartées à la base qui se rejoignent au sommet pour résister à tous les vents. Son ascension s'effectue par des escaliers et par des ascenseurs. La tour est financée directement par Gustave Eiffel, qui en échange obtient une concession d'exploitation de 20 ans auprès de la ville. Le succès est immédiat. À la fin de l'exposition, l'investissement d'Eiffel est déjà rentabilisé. Avec 50 millions de visiteurs, l'exposition universelle de 1900 est la plus importante des manifestations françaises. Paris accueille au même moment les deuxièmes Jeux olympiques. C'est l'occasion de réaménager la ville. Le pont Alexandre III, dédié à l'Alliance franco-russe, traverse la Seine qui constitue l'axe majeur de l'événement. L'espace est desservi par la première ligne de métro et deux nouvelles gares, Orsay et les Invalides. La gare de Lyon est par ailleurs reconstruite. Un double trottoir roulant à deux vitesses permet de parcourir une boucle de 3,5 km autour du site. Sur la rive droite de la Seine, le porche du Petit Palais témoigne de l'affirmation de l'art nouveau. Le Grand Palais, plus classique, s'appuie sur une structure où la pierre rivalise avec le métal et le verre. Un vieux Paris est reconstitué sur une plateforme construite sur le fleuve. Sur la rive gauche, un globe céleste disposant de trois étages intérieurs permet d'initier les visiteurs en astronomie et en botanique. Au Champ de Mars, le palais de l'électricité, érigé devant un grand bassin, émerveille les visiteurs le soir quand l'éclairage électrique illumine les pavillons et les allées. Paris devient le symbole de la modernité. Contrairement aux précédentes, les expositions universelles de 1889 et 1900 ont laissé de nombreux monuments et infrastructures qui marquent le paysage de la capitale. Au XXe siècle, les expositions universelles ont lieu sur les cinq continents et sont réglementées depuis 1928 par le Bureau international des expositions qui siège à Paris. Aujourd'hui, leurs thématiques sont principalement liées à la coopération internationale et la résolution des grands défis planétaires. Thank you. So as we saw, as I mentioned earlier, these um, World's Fairs or what they call Exposition Universelle was a way to display um, the modernity of Paris and the inventions, electricity, you know, Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower, which was built in some of the iconic um, iconic bridges and monuments that you see today in Paris. All of them kind of were constructed in those two World's Fairs. Uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the uh, World's Fair of 1931. 
I have a video for that, but I don't that doesn't have any subtitles, so I think I'm just good. I think it's better to just talk about it. But in the 1931 Exposition Universelle, uh, it was specifically a way that the French uh, used the World's Fair to display its colonies in Paris. So you actually built, they rebuilt, it's also mentioned in the 1900 one, they rebuilt miniatures of, of, um, of their colonies, you know, the Angkor Wat Temple from Cambodia. And they actually brought the indigenous population from their colonies to actually live in these homes, in these monuments that they created for the for the um, for the purposes of the World's Fair. So it's very interesting how these worlds. So I, I kind of talk about this importance of the World's Fairs to kind of glorify Paris, to show the progress that Paris has made makes made through the 19th and into the 20th century. Another segment that I add, and as you see, the, the, the class is very interdisciplinary, right? So another segment that I add in the class, and this is my own interest, is a section called Paris Noir, or which discusses the African-American presence in Paris and also the African presence in Paris. So we have, uh, we have um, a lot of writers, painters, musicians who worked and lived in Paris in the 1930s and uh, 1920s and 1930s and made for many of the African Americans it was a way for them to escape the racism of the United States. So I'm just going to show you a quick PowerPoint. It's kind of long but I'm just going to kind of quickly run through it that shows you some of the important personalities of the of the African American population that lived in Paris, lived and worked in Paris in the 20s and 30s, in, including the African population and the Caribbean Francophone population. So I'm going to try and share my screen here. Um, see if I that works. Ma'am, do I share your PPT? No, I think I can share it. So I think I'm sharing it right now. If I have any problems, I'll. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, all right. So, so this was a this is a, a a PowerPoint that I had created for another talk that I had given, but I often include it in my class uh, just to talk about this since since the course is taught in America uh, I, it would it's interesting to hear about the African American presence in Paris in the 20s and 30s so just to um, um, okay yeah uh, so I just show a little map of Paris that kind of gives you an idea about where let's see how do I get the, um, the layout okay can you see this is it too small? the 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 image okay i'm just going to i need to get full mode right um so this just gives you a little idea about paris in the jazz age what they call the 20s was the jazz age uh, and I'm going to go in the next one. OK, these two um, uh, at the time in 1919, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Blaise Dian, what, well, who was an African and uh, we all know about Du Bois, who was an African-American philosopher and thinker. They convened the Pan-African Congress because there was this notion of Pan-Africanism that was uh, important in, in uh, during that time and that was held in Paris at that time in 1919. So I talk a little bit about that. Um, now, this is a group of uh, the Harlem Hellfighters with a group of the 369th Regiment. Uh, remember at the time, um, there were African Americans who fought with the French Army during World War One, and uh, because they couldn't, they they couldn't, they they were not accepted in the American Army, so they were actually accepted by the French Army, and a lot of them fought with the French Army in World War One, and after World War One, stayed on in Paris, and many of them became musicians. So you have the Harlem Hellfighters Brass Band, uh, which was the form, formed by members of the 369th Regiment, mainly. Uh, and uh, and um, in the next slide, uh, you'll see these are the two important nobles, Cecil and Hubie Blake, are musicians and composers who lived and worked in Paris at the time. Uh, Picasso, the famous painter, was very influenced. African uh, art was very, very popular. So you see the influence of African art, you know, the masks on the faces as in, in his uh, painting Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Uh, René Marin, who was a French francophone writer, won the Prix Goncourt that year, one of the earliest, uh, earliest Africans to have won the Prix Goncourt, which is the most prestigious French prize uh, for his novel Batuala. 
Uh, again, uh, Eugene Bular was another member of the of the of the um, who was an army guy who started his who started a club in Paris in that in that period. And Zelly was another important club, African American club uh, started by an African American that uh, people from all over a lot of the expat expatriate Americans attended. Le Grand Duc. So these are a series of clubs that were opened by African American men and women. And Ada Bricktop Smith opened her own cabaret called Bricktops. Uh, Josephine Baker. I don't know whether you've heard of her, but she was the most well known of African Americans who ended up who danced with La Revue Negre and ended up in Paris and decided to stay on because she was not accepted in in France. But then she became a big star uh, in Paris. Uh, Sidney Bechet, another important jazz saxophonist, clarinet, clarinet, clarinetist and composer who ended up then living and working in Paris. Um, and there's a famous song I would tell in, in Paris uh, in 2011 uses uh, Sidney Bechet uh, tune in as the as the backdrop as one of the background music in his movie. Uh, another important um, jazz was a big became very important, mainly brought in by the African-Americans. But here you have somebody in a Frenchman who's also talking about jazz. Uh, we have two famous musicians, uh, Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli, who also practice jazz. Very important. OK, other important writers who lived in Paris at that time in the 20s and 30s is Langston Hughes. Many of the members, many of the artists of the Harlem Renaissance, which was this group in the 1920s that was um, mainly African-Americans. The movement began in Harlem and it was a valorization of black music, music, art and literature. But many of them moved to Paris. And so Langston Hughes uh, lived in Paris for a while and there's a um, he wrote a poem called Jazz Band in a Parisian cabaret, which is very much based on it during his time there. County Cullen, another poet who lived in Paris. Uh, Claude McKay, who is actually fluent in French, also wrote a book called Banjo, which was set in Marseille. And some women uh, writers who also lived and worked in Paris at this time, Gwendolyn Bennett. Uh, there's another painter called Henry Osawa Tanner. Uh, another woman sculptress, uh, Augusta Savage, uh, another painter, Lo Lois Malou Jones. So you had um, uh, a lot of uh, this is the colonial exhibition 1931 that I mentioned earlier. Claude McKay's book. Um, now, in addition to the African-Americans, there were also African writers who later on African writers who lived and studied in Paris and Senghor was one of them. Um, and uh, he was one of the leaders of the movement of Negritude, and he ended up becoming the prime minister, the president of Senegal, of an independent Senegal. But he and his colleagues started a magazine called L'Etudiant Noir. And uh, so this valorization of the African experience, right? Um, uh, because earlier the Africans had just been treated as slaves, but this notion of African being African, the valorization of African culture, which they kind of encouraged at the time. Amy Césaire was another, uh, he was a Martinican writer and poet who also joined, sing he was part of that Negritude movement. And Leo Damas was the third, he was also Martinican, also part of that movement of Negritude. Uh, these are some of the books that they wrote, uh, Cahier du Retour au Pays Natal, Notes notes from a Native Land. Senghor wrote an anthology of African-American, of, um, uh, of African poetry, and Leon Damas wrote this book, Pigments. So just to, L'Etudio Noir was a magazine that they started in Paris because they were all students in Paris in 1935. Uh, there are a couple of, these are a couple of uh, Paulette Nardal and her sister, I forget her name. OK, her sister Paulette, I forget the name of the sister, started uh, creating a little salon just for the African-American, uh, Amer African-American and African artists living in Paris. And they created a journal called La Revue du Monde Noir. And that was part of 1931-32. And that import that salon was really important in Paris because it gave um, uh, it was an important meeting place for all the expat African Americans and Africans who lived in Paris at that time. So again, 1920s, uh, 30s, an important uh, part of um, uh, Paris, important part of Parisian history. Uh, so anyway, so I end, so I I end with that section on uh, Paris Noir. Though I there's another one. I do one more class where I talk about the you know current 
architectural projects in 21st century Paris and also talk about Paris in the 20th and 21st century as a multi, as a crucible of multi ethnicity because a lot of as we know a lot of the immigrants from Africa from francophone Africa and North Africa moved and settled in Paris so we, there are different enclaves within the city of Paris that are African or North African so I kind of talk a lot talk a little bit about the multi ethnicity in Paris there's also a section um, uh, called Passage Brady, Brady, which is a which is an area where you have Indian shops because there's a large Sri Lankan Tamil population in Paris. So there's an area in Paris which has a lot of Indian shops and restaurants. It's called Passage Brady. So uh, just to show that Paris has, you know, the evolving and changing Paris. In addition to some of the texts and the cultural stuff that I do, I also show films. And I, I'd mentioned earlier the film by Woody Allen called Midnight in Paris, which actually talks about Paris in the 1920s and 30s. I do another film called Cezanne et Moi, which is about the Impressionist uh, period in Paris, the life of the Impressionist painters. And... Um, I also do excerpts from a film made in 2009 called Paris, I Love You, which are films made by different filmmakers that deal with different neighborhoods in Paris. So it's kind of a the, the course, as I said, has to do with um, uh, is interdisciplinary, deals with literature, poetry, painting, art. Uh, and so it introduces it provides a kind of an interdisciplinary view of Paris, the city of light. Um, the uh, how much time do I have? Do I have a little more time? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I wanted to talk very briefly about the second course that I teach. I'd mentioned earlier, I teach a course on French cinema, also in translation. So how do I set up that course? Um, I focus on films. Uh, we watch um, the films that are focused, we focus on is films, French cinema from the 1950s to the present, right? And we spend, but we spend the, spend the, the we spend the three, first three weeks kind of doing an overview of French cinema from the beginning, from the Lumiere brothers, uh, through the silent era of the 1920s and then films from the 30s, 40s and until we get to the films from the 50s. So we do about eight films and the way I do these is the students watch, the, we don't watch the films in class, but we watch the films outside of class. So the films are watched in French, but with English subtitles. So the students watch those films in class and then when we come to class, I show uh, small segments of the film we discuss, do close readings of certain parts of the film. So the discussion in class is in English, though the students are watching the film in the original French with subtitles. So what are, what are the films that I cover? I, I, I'm, I cover films mainly starting, as I said, from the Nouvelle Vague or the New Wave. So I start with films by Francois Truffaut and Godard, of course, the famous 400 Blows by Truffaut, which is a coming of age novel of this young Antoine. And then Godard's famous film Breathless, A bout de souffle. And then I end the class and we do about eight films. So we have students and I do and along with the films, the students are also reading. Uh, from a book that uh, reading chapters from a book that gives you the historical and cultural um, context in which the films were made. So the whole notion of teaching this class on cinema is to kind of put the films in context, right? In their in their political, social, cultural context. Uh, so the eight films that we do in the ending of the films, I end with what I call cinema de banlieue. And the word banlieue means suburbs. And when we talk about suburbs in French, it's the suburbs that, that are on the periphery of the big cities in Paris and have been uh, basically spaces of unrest in since the 1980s. Uh, it has a large immigrant population, but it also has a French population. So it's people of people who do not have the means to live in the city and live in these big, huge housing projects in the outskirts of Paris. So I end with a couple of films that are set in this milieu, right? Um, the films that I do cover is our, uh, as I said, Truffaut and Godard, and then we move on to films, a film from the 70s by, I do a film by a woman, woman film director, Di Di Diane Curis called Diablo Mont, uh, translated as Peppermint Soda. I do another film by um, Agnès Varda, who is another very well-known film director called Vagabond. I do the Louis Mal film, Goodbye Children, which I think may be very well known, which is set during the occupation in Paris. So each of the films 
uh, deal with a particular historical period in Paris and so provide that kind of cultural context to Paris, to, to oh, sorry, to France, right? Um, the Au Revoir Les Enfants, I do, master, and then I do two films, three films from the setting where the setting is the banlieue or the suburbs, right? Uh, there's a famous film called Hate by Mathieu Kasovitz, made in 1995. More recently, a film made by Céline Siama called Bond de Fille or Girlhood, uh, made in 2014. And then I end with Les Miserables, which is a film made by Lajli uh, in 2019. So those, and I do a comparative reading of the film Hate and the film Girlhood because one is a male centered film and the other is a female centered film. So, in addition to talking about cinema um, as cinema, I also talk about cinema as text, right? So, the idea is to talk about cinema as text, to bring in issues of gender, to be, bring in issues of class, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, those, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of those two courses that I teach in translation. And over the years, that had the, the courses have actually been very popular. And it does draw in people uh, from all disciplines who are interested in learning more about French culture. And through the class, I've actually had a few students who then have decided they want to study the French language. So, uh, the courses are also part of our general ed, of our global. Requirement, we have a, a requirement at Manhattan for global education, global gen ed. So it also counts towards global, the global gen, general education and also counts as a as a, and as an elective for our global and international studies majors. So just to give you an overview of these two classes that I teach, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about either of those courses. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them unless you have someone who's going to introduce that part of it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for imparting your knowledge to us. Now our question of session will begin. So I request everyone to come forward with their questions. Any comments would be great too. Any questions or comments? Thank you so much, and uh, it's an it was an interesting way to learn how you've drawn the students back to learning French through translations, and that's a new idea that uh, learning of uh, third and second languages through translation makes it more interesting, and that is something new that uh, you have spoken of because you would. Mm -hmm. Talking of translations, but drawing someone to another language is something that has been a new uh, experience that you have shared with us. So it was a wonderful thought and yes. a wonderful talk. And I, I'm so eternally thankful to you for sharing this with our students and participants. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know it was probably not really uh, the conference was probably more about talking about translation. But I, when I spoke to Professor Srivastava, I said this is the way I'm going to approach it because I'm not a translator. But um, this is one way of kind of drawing more people to learning the language because I don't know what the enrollments in your university is for French. But in America, many of the small colleges are losing French students. We don't have as many students who are studying French. So this is one way to, to impart the culture you know, without even if they don't have a knowledge of the language. So that was my thinking. Yeah, in our university, it is mandatory for the students to learn a uh, foreign business language every semester. Okay. And we have French, German and Spanish, but definitely French is a little more difficult, especially in terms of pronunciation and talking mm. and and since there are no native speakers, it, it becomes a little difficult to get the students on, you know, the mm -hmm. right track. Mm -hmm. But since they have to do it, they learn. And we have very brilliant French teachers with us, the mm -hmm. three of them. But mm -hmm. this way of teaching, the, I mean, getting students interested into the language through translations was a very novel idea. And I'm mm -hmm. sure our faculty has learned something for it and they will make the classes more interesting through this methodology. Thank you. 
Do you offer a lot of professional classes in French? I mean, you offer classes in business French uh, because that's another way to attract students is to kind of make French. If you add, you know, add this notion of professionalism, right? A medical French or business French or so I was just curious as to that if that is part of your curriculum. Uh, well, ours is basically functional knowledge of uh, the language in order to interact if they get placement in global companies. But uh, yes, at our headquarters, they have graduation honors in French and MA in French, and they have all other courses. But at our Lucknow campus, we do not have them as yet. Right. Because there okay. is a great shortage of French teachers in India. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to do an online course with you at any time, so let me know. <laughs> oh, OK. That's such a welcome uh, suggestion. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, one of our students okay. has some question. Thank you. Please go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask for the admission process of the university you're teaching in. Oh, uh, it's basically you just have to contact. There is an admissions office. If you go to the website, you should find out about the there's an admissions. Uh, there's a section on admissions and you have to contact the the people who are in charge of admissions and there's a form that you fill out, etc. like any American university, right? So I, I'm not really that involved in the admissions part of it, so it's something that you would have to contact. If you go on the website, you should, should be able to find information about that. Thank you, ma'am. OK. Ma'am, I don't think there are any more questions. Okay. If there Thank are you. any, then we'll forward it to you by the, through the WhatsApp group. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give a talk. I, it's been a real pleasure uh, sharing some of my ideas with you. So, and please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you, ma'am, for giving us. We are very grateful to you for giving us your precious time. We thank all the dignitaries, resource persons, faculty, as well as student coordinators for making this event a success. We wish you safety and good health in these difficult times. I would like to welcome Mr. Raj Mishra to give the vote of thanks. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. Let me first of all start by giving glory to the Almighty for making today's event a resounding success. I express my gratitude towards Dr. Benita Mehta of Manhattan Villa College, New York for her valuable contributions to this event and for sharing her valuable experience. My heartfelt thanks to the heads of various departments and the faculty who are present here. I owe special gratitude to the non-teaching staff and my fellow students who have worked hard to ensure that this event becomes a memorable success. I thank all the distinguished invitees present here for accepting our invitation and being here. I thank everyone who worked behind the screen today. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending today's meeting, especially our speakers and making this day memorable for us. We are very grateful for your presence today, ma'am. With this, I would like to end the session. Don't forget to join us on Monday on 27th March 2023 for an equally amazing session given by Professor Kavita Rastogi from University of Lucknow and Dr. Seval Aine Karakabe from Turkey. Thank you. Thank you.